So um, I'll start with the conclusion. Uh, the conclusion is uh, containers and databases make happy developers. They can quickly spin things up and uh, they can get going with their project and they don't really have to worry about all the complexities of infrastructure. Uh, but as soon as you think of containers as ephemeral things, um, ephemeral things plus databases give a whole bunch of DevOps headaches, right? Because as soon as you lose the container, you don't want to lose all your data. Well, I suppose there may be some reasons why you want to lose your data, but generally that's considered a, a poor form. So there's four things that four themes that we're going to talk through about data redundancy, uh, self-discovery, self-healing, and application discovery of your containers and your database that's represented inside those containers. So we're going to try and evaluate those four things as we go along. So uh, let us start off with, uh, here's another fine mess you got me into. So I grew up in England, and literally there were two, sometimes three TV channels. So I got to watch lots of old Laurel and Hardy movies as I, uh, as I grew up. And so I think it's a fine quote, because if you think about our current application architectures, they're kind of really weird because at some level at the bottom you've got these uh, re relational databases or transactional systems. You've generally put a cache in front of them to try and give them some operational scalability. You've got some data warehouse on the left hand side, you know, that would have been in some data warehousing tool or uh, these days in Hadoop. And you've got to try and bring all of this data together and all this infrastructure together to answer the most basic uh, questions in your application. So that looks like there's a lot of complexity in that kind of architecture. If you now think about how we deploy those applications, you've got you know, the developer working on their, their, their development environment. That then gets pushed to a test system. How is that test system provisioned? Well, it could be with Puppet, it could be with Chef or Salt or Ansible. And then it gets pushed into production, and that's going to get configured or provisioned in a slightly different way. So the thing that the developer built and test against is probably not represented by anything that looks like uh, the same thing in production. So we've got all of these differences through the development pipeline as you try and develop these kind of applications. And then we've got how, how we utilize hardware. So kind of on the left is how most databases currently work, which is they sit on top of a, um, an uh, operating system file system, which has got a page cache which you then talk to the block interface, and then you talk to your SSDs or your hard disks. So there's lots of layers in between there. What you really want to do is have your database talk to a memory system and then parallelize all the reads and writes to your flash or to your, you know, perhaps next year, your 3D exploit system uh, to get the, the scalability you want. So uh, let's talk about containers. Most of you are using containers, but let's quickly set the scene. Uh, so the whole philosophy of containers is build, ship, and run, and the thing that you build is ultimately the thing that you run. It could be on your laptop, it could be in your test system, it could be in your production system. It's the same image. It's the same set of packages and dependencies. So you're not having to try and debug a production system which has got a different version of Linux or a different version of glibc. You're trying to actually have the same set of dependencies all the way through. Uh, but you also want um, uh, encapsulation, right? You want these processes to run so they don't interfere with each other. And so traditionally, you would have probably used VMs to do that. So as I said, what do containers give you? They give you encapsulation of your dependencies, the specific version of Python, the specific packages, and so on and so forth. But as I said, they give you um, process isolation, right? Allowing you to run multiple things on the same box and in theory, not to interfere with each other. Um, this is not technically correct, but it's, it's easy to think of containers as faster, lighter weight uh, virtualization. So how, what does, how do you compare those two? So quickly in pictures, you know, you've got the, um, the virtualized environment on the left where you've got your, your piece of hardware, you've got a hypervisor, you've got a guest operating system, and then your code running with inside that VM. Um, the picture on the left, left is how you know uh, docker in the container world would look like where you've got an engine that's running those containers you're not keeping a whole copy of that guest operating system you're not trying to virtualize the cpu the memory the iops and the network so in theory it should be much more efficient and some of the customers i've worked with um, often see somewhere between 5 10 and 20x better density of containers versus vms so there's some kind of reality in, in what this picture is saying. Um, what does a Docker file look like? Well, a Docker file is trying to describe everything that uh, this process needs. 
and it's supposed to be vaguely human readable. So we're saying we're going to use a particular uh, Python version. We're going to add code from our local directory. We're going to uh, install some system packages. Uh, and in this case, install some Python um, uh, packages as well. And so it's a very easy thing to, to read in order to understand um, the image that you're building and therefore then executing. Um, so um, there is an open container initiative. There's lots and lots of vendors. You'll see every vendor in the sun uh, is wanting to play in this space. And there is a set of standards up at opencontainers.org that will essentially ensure that you're not uh, baked into a particular vendor's view of the world. You've got some ability to port those images and those libraries from one vendor to another. Um, so that's the interoperability that the open standards are trying to get you to. Um, when I first started um, uh, using Docker, so I used to work at Docker. Uh, I used to work at MongoDB before that, but uh, this will all become true. And um, as I'll explain this all in a minute. But um, there's a lot of components in the Docker ecosystem. So on the top left, you've got a container. And the container is essentially, uh, or the image, um, uh, gets run inside of a container is the way to think about it. And so um, uh, in the middle, you've got uh, the Docker engine. Uh, this wonderful character is called MollyDoc. Uh, and MollyDoc is running all of these containers for you. Um, and so uh, how do you get a Docker engine running? Well, bottom left, you've got Docker machine. Its job is to spin up new VMs or provision new instances on DigitalOcean or EC2. Uh, with a pre-installed Docker engine so it's ready to run. So that's great. I've, I can now create an engine. I can run containers on it. Um, on the right-hand side, I have now want to orchestrate my application. My application is probably not one container, especially if you're thinking about microservices. It's lots of containers, lots of services. So Docker Compose is a way to describe the orchestration of your application, all of those services. And then when you execute a Compose file, it's going to state all, start all the containers for you. So if you have a single um, Docker engine, all of those containers get started in one engine. And that's probably great for your, your development. But for production, you probably want to span this across more than one host. So top right, we have Docker Swarm. And that's the kind of native clustering of Docker engines. And so essentially, what I can now do is I can use Compose to deploy to a cluster. And then Compose will allow me to place those containers onto different hosts. So that's kind of the Docker ecosystem in pictures, is the best that I could draw it. Um, OK, um, we've got one Aerospike user. I'll give you the quick marketing uh, pitch for Aerospike, and then we'll actually go and write some code, because that's much more fun. Um, but uh, Aerospike was designed to uh, optimize for uh, SSDs. Um, and so it was built for SSDs from, from the get-go. Typically, we see um, cases where we can consolidate between 10x and 20x the number of servers uh, on other database solutions. So um, we can use the resources more efficiently. Therefore, we can reduce the number of servers. Um, how do we do that? As I said, it was designed for Flash. Um, and so what we do is we store our primary. It's a key value store. It's a distributed key value store. We store our primary key index as a red-black tree in DRAM. And then the data gets stored in uh, SSD. So that means that the primary key lookup in DRAM is very fast. You then got parallelized access to SSDs. So you can read and write um, up to 16 or 20 SSDs per chassis. And so this can give you very high throughput and very low latency, but also sta stability of those as well. Uh, we've been working with uh, Intel for some time on 3D XPoint, which is the transactional memory. Uh, so that will give you the, um, the latency of DRAM, but more of the cost model of SSD. So it kind of sits between the two of those. And so I think Intel is going to start shipping that later this year or early next year. And so we're ready to go with that from day one. Um, internally, we do master-based clustering. Uh, what that really means is every write is synchronous to the master and its secondary copies, which means that you can read your own writes. Uh, you don't have to do a quorum read. And it means that if you have a failure of a node, you can automatically fail over to another node because all of those nodes are equal. Um, so that's how we get the high availability and high consistency. 
Uh, finally, developer experience. Uh, most of you, well, I actually didn't ask. How many of you, how many of you are developers? And how many of you are you on the upside? OK. Uh, so I would say that's kind of two thirds, one third. So uh, keeping developers, a lot of these things we talked about keeps ops happy. Um, running 24 7, uh, very reliable uh, and consistent uh, throughput and latency. Um, you've got to have developers love it to build something. So, uh, uh, Aerospike is schema free. We have things like geospatial, list and map support. Uh, we integrate with all the popular frameworks like Spring and Play. Um, and then, you know, we're doing the, the work uh, I'll show you earlier with Docker. All right, where do we get used? Um, anywhere where you need lots of data, uh, so high volume or high velocity of data. So an example is real-time fraud, prote uh, fraud uh, prevention, where you need to look at a lot of data, uh, data points really quickly in order to make a decision whether you approve or deny that transaction. Um, it's very typical in our uh, ad tech customers where you'd use this for recommendation engines or any other cases where you want to look at a, a big graph of data quickly. OK, and this is one benchmark that um, Google actually published uh, at the beginning of this year of being able to do 1 million writes per second um, on a node, uh, on, on 50 nodes in this case. Um, and so that gives you the kind of scale of performance you can get with Aerospike. But not everybody's problem is speed or scale. Uh, it just shows you what you can do. It helps you um, actually extend that journey. And uh, you can also use uh, Aerospike as a pure in-memory. You don't have to have uh, SSD storage behind. And so if you compare it to Redis, you can do the same workload on one Aerospike server versus 12 Redis nodes. All right, that's the marketing over. Is everybody happy with the marketing is over? There's some nods, OK. All right, uh, Aerospike and Docker. So uh, let's go over to this slide. So we talked about four things that you really care about. You want to care about data, data redundancy, right? Because containers are ephemeral. And it means that when the container goes, you better have another copy of that data. So you need to, have, you need to be able to set this up to have as many copies as you feel is appropriate. Um, as those containers arrive, do you want to be sitting at a, a console, bashing away, configuring the database cluster? Anybody want to do that? There's normally one who says yes. All right. Um, let's assume you don't want to do that. So you want to automatically form the cluster um, as those containers come and go. Um, obviously, you also, as containers come and go, you want to automatically balance the data in the cluster. Um, but equally from your application, as that topology of that cluster is changing as containers come and go, the application has to also self-discover what that cluster looks like. You don't want to have to be starting and stopping your application instances to tell it where the uh, database currently resides and the IP address or the host names. So you need to kind of automate all of that to give yourself a flexible uh, infrastructure. OK. I've managed to do that in about ooh, 10 minutes. All right, who wants to do a demo? Write code. Yes, OK. Um, I do warn you, this is a live demo. It's bound to go wrong. I'm running five or six VMs on my laptop. Uh, I'm notoriously bad at typing and speaking. Uh, so um, debugging from the floor is encouraged. Um, so let's kind of let's run through a, a, a scenario. So we want to get from development all the way through to production. So we're going to create a tiny little uh, Python and Aerospike application. We're going to run that locally, and then we're going to deploy that to a swarm cluster. And then we're going to scale out not only our web tier, but we're going to scale out our database tier. And the application will just carry on working as we do all of that. That sound like fun? Yes, OK. All right, so here's where we're going to start. We're going to start off with a single web node, a sing single Aerospike instance. And then we're going to end up with something that looks like on the right, where we've got HA proxies, our load balancer, uh, in front of our web farm. So we can carry on scaling um, our web farm behind HA proxy. And then we're going to scale out our Aerospike cluster by simply adding more, more nodes or more containers. OK, let's go build an application. So uh, is that readable from the back? OK. So um, this is just a simple Python application. And I'll point out some of the key, uh, the key things here. So uh, here, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm setting up a, a, a dictionary telling me where at least one of the nodes of the, uh, the cluster resides. 
and further down here, I'll actually do a, a client connection. So this is just like in JDBC or whatever mapping framework you're used to, uh, establishing that first connection to the cluster. What I'm going to do in this code is I'm going to um, execute a series of operations. And so I've defined my list of operations I'm going to execute. Then I'm going to uh, execute against that against the database. And remember, uh, Aerospike is a key value store. So I'm going to pass in the key, and then I'm going to pass in the list of operations I want to perform. And then I'm going to increment some counters. I'm going to keep some summary data around as well. And then after that's all done, I'm going to then render the new HTML page. All right, so it's pretty simple. So let us start this all up. So I'm going to use Docker Compose, and I'll, I'll show you the Compose file in a minute. So you do Docker Compose up, which is essentially going to start all the services that are defined in our Compose file. All right, so that's all up and running. And if I now go to my web page, uh, here is the most awesome application I have built for you. All right, Coke, Pepsi, or tap water. We can now vote. So we've got a mini voting application. Um, and so what does that look like in terms of the configuration for Docker? Right, we've seen the application code. What does, how did I configure that in, in Docker? So here is the Docker file. And so this describes the image of our uh, application. And this is the one we saw earlier. But I'm going to describe, I'm going to use a particular version of Python. I'm going to install some system packages. I'm going to add some, uh, some code. I'm going to run pip install. And that's just going to install some Python packages. I'm going to expose a specific port. This is essentially just opening up the firewall for that container. And then I'm going to run Python. All right, so the Docker file is pretty simple. How did I orchestrate that? So let's have a look at our compose file. So in the compose file, I have two services. I have my web service, and I have my Aerospike service. And so if we look at the, the web service, I have a command that says build. And all that does is it does a Docker build of that image if the image is not already a present. So this is actually running that Docker file with all those steps to go build myself the image. I'm now going to decide which, which ports I expose. And so this is mapping from the inside to the outside of the container. If you remember my Docker file exposed port 5000. And so what I'm saying here is I want to map port 5000 on the inside to port 5000 on the outside. So in this case, it's a straight through mapping, but clearly you can actually redirect that through different ports. I'm going to use a link, and that says I'm going to link to a service called Aerospike, which is the one below. And that's just going to open up so that those con two containers can talk to each other. And I set a uh, host name that's just an environment variable and some additional environment variables here. So that's the web service. I'm also going to use um, a second service, Aerospike. And instead of building, I'm going to use an image. So uh, on uh, Docker Hub um, is a hosted service where vendors like Aerospike and a whole bunch of others, but individuals like you guys, can post your images of your applications or your services. So we're just going to. Um, uh, use the image from Aerospike called Aerospike Server, and I'm just going to pick the latest. Right? I'm a developer. I always want the latest and the greatest. So I want the latest, and I'm going to use that. And I'm also going to map um, from the outside of the container, either host, a volume to the inside. Um, so what this will allow me to do, as we'll see later in the demo, is to store the data outside of the container. Uh, we don't necessarily have to store the data inside the container. So we'll see how that all works. So that's how I've created those two services. And as I did the um, Docker Compose start back up here, or Docker Compose up, you can see both of these services starting. OK. So um, that's, that's our development. So let's go back to our slides. Questions at this point? Making sense? Sort of? All right. So. Um, here is our Docker file, and I'll, I'll post these slides later. Um, but this just illustrates kind of what we just talked about. So um, that's development. Um, and the developer's given his thumbs up and wants to roll into production because uh, with the, um, the, the basketball, uh, is the NBA playoffs are coming up. So we want to get our voting application out to see whether people want tap water for their drink or maybe, you know, Coke or Pepsi. So, 
this is the key part of uh, Docker. As you go through this journey from dev into production, what you want to do is you want to in inject additional behavior. You want to take what was created in the previous step and then supplement or inject additional things on there. It could be for security reasons. It could be to add in a load balancer, for example. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, use HAProxy as our load balancer. Anybody use HAProxy out there? A couple of people. Well, if you've ever used HAProxy, um, each time you add a node into HAProxy, you've got to reconfigure a conf file and execute a command to go and essentially uh, cause the HAProxy service to restart so it knows all of those uh, services are there. I think that's kind of like dull and un uninteresting. So what we're going to do is we're going to automate that process uh, so you don't have to go and manually bash at a terminal. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to add more um, web nodes um, dynamically as we go. All right. Now, before we get there, um, if I, is everybody OK if I run this on a single node in production? Uh, no, I mean, generally. I mean, you could do. Um, but if you lose that node, you lose everything. Um, so let's, let's try and distribute this application across many nodes. So this is kind of where we need to talk about Docker networking. This was introduced in 1.8. Um, and essentially, this provides the ability to create a network that spans multiple hosts. So essentially, if you, if you think about how you deployed your web tier and your application tier, historically, you would have maybe put them on the same subnet so that you've got some isolation of the network between the application and the database. So what Docker does underneath the covers is it creates a VXLAN. And a VXLAN can span these multiple physical hosts uh, to connect those hosts together. And then you allow each container to join that VXLAN. So that VXLAN becomes private to just those containers. Um, so this was, in, as I said, introduced in 1.8. And this is uh, what we're going to do is use this to actually create a private network that goes across all of these containers. So let's get to the demo. All right, so I can do Docker Compose, and I can do up. This time I'm going to put it into the background, so I'm going to do minus D. And as you'll see, we've got four services starting. And I'll explain those four services in a minute. And if we now go to our production website, what would we expect to see? Here's our voting application again. Uh, it's the miracles of modern coding. Right, so I can carry on using this. Um, and now, let, let's say we want to scale the web service. So I can now do uh, docker compose scale web equals four, right? So what Docker Compose is now going to look at is going to see how many of those uh, services are running, and then start enough. Um, uh, it will start more containers in order to meet that constraint of four. So if you go and look at our cluster now, I've got this nice pictorial representation underneath. And you can see the, uh, the green boxes are the web servers. You can see this is starting to be spread across the cluster. OK. Now, my application carries on working. I haven't had to do anything. And if you notice just about in here, you can see the IP address of the node that actually uh, responded to that request. So you can see HAProxy's round robining that data. And just to prove it even further, what I can now do is I can do Docker run. Um, I, a good colleague of mine at Docker, um, uh, Jessie, she runs absolutely everything in a container, uh, Skype, uh, Spotify. Um, uh, I think that may be a bit extreme, uh, but it means that when she gets a new laptop, she just has to install Docker, and now everything runs. Um, I'm actually going to run uh, uh, Aerospike's command line tool um, uh, in a container as well. So Docker run minus IT for interactive, remove. I need to be on the network of prod, because we've got this private network. I can't get to the containers unless I'm on that right network. And I'm going to run Aerospike, Aerospike Tools. And our command line tool is called AQL. And I'm going to give it a host name of prod Aerospike1. There you go. So I can now do select star from uh, test.votes. Oops, and I always put a semicolon. There you go. There's one of our vote records. And if I now do a select star from test.summary, uh, there is the summary of all of our, uh, of, our note, of our votes coming in from the different app servers. All right, 
you want to see how we did that? Yes, OK, good. So um, here is my new Docker Compose file for production. And you see I've still got my, um, my web node and my web, web service. Uh, but I've also got my HA proxy service, and we'll talk about that in a second. So my web service is, instead of building from the source code, I want to take the image that the developer created for me. So I'm just going to download this from um, an image that the developer uploaded for me, because I'm the ops guy. Um, but also, um, I can now t make use of um, the ability to, in Docker Compose, to extend services to change behavior. So I'm going to say I'm going to extend from this file haproxy.yaml, and I'm going to extend this service. So let's have a quick look at haproxy. So haproxy is now defining two services. One is um, uh, a down here is my application I want to run, and the second is this uh, haproxy server, which is going to uh, rely on an image called interlock, and we'll talk about interlock in a second. Uh, but Essentially, the problem we've got to solve is the auto reconfiguration of HA proxy. So, what I want to do is listen to those events of the container start and then automatically reconfigure HA proxy. So, that, um, that's the piece that's going to solve that for us. So, going back to our Docker Compose file, um, I've also got a discovery service, and this is, uh, and I'll talk about this in a second as well, but this is using the same technique of seeing the containers come and go in order to reconfigure the cluster automatically. Um, if I go down to our, our Aerospike service, um, one of the things that you can do in production is what I've done here, is that you can see that I, in production I care about using a specific version um, of the software. So I'm not just using Aerospike server latest, I'm using uh, 374, right? So you can actually nail down the specific images. And so as you go through the life cycle, you can inject these specific behaviors. The second thing I've done is um, typically you don't want to run multiple nodes of a database cluster on the same physical host, right? Because if you lose that physical host, you may lose many nodes of your database cluster. So what I've done here is I've defined a label, and you could call this whatever you wanted, but I just called it Comeris by cluster, and I've given it an, a value of prod cluster. Uh, what I can now do in, um, in Docker Compose is I can add an affinity rule. And this affinity rule essentially says um, you can start this container on any engine where this uh, a container doesn't exist with this label. So essentially, this rule is forcing um, only one Aerospike container to be able to run per Docker engine host. All right. Now, you can add in different affinity rules to say um, it can only run on a machine with SSD or with this much DRAM. So you can actually inject these behaviors in, uh, down the kind of the development process stream in order to get the deployment characteristics that you want in production versus what you had in test versus what the developer had. Again, this is just adding on behaviors on top of each other. So if we look at our base cluster, um, again, we've got our based on interlock, and um, uh, here is a set of volumes. So that's kind of how we did it. Um, do, 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 do. So the next step is uh, we scaled the web tier. Hurrah, that's how we did it, and you can go review this later. Now we want to scale the Aerospike cluster. So let's go and do that. Now, if you recall, what I had to do is I created this private VXLAN. Um, and as a, so that the web and the database are talking on a private network that nothing else can get access to. What I've got to do is I've got to introduce our discovery service to that network so uh, we can actually see those um, containers come and go. So let me just do that. Uh, do, 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 do. And this is usually where I make lots of typing mistakes. Storm zero network. Connect to prod, prod discovery one. It worked first time. OK. Uh, OK, now I can now scale my Aerospike tier. So Docker Compose scale Aerospike equals three. So I'm going to have a cluster of three Aerospike nodes now. So I'll kick that off. You can see that starting. If you go back to our, our web browser, you can actually see we've got three nodes. 
uh, running. So if I now wanted to start a fourth node, obviously I've got one machine here I can add the fourth node to. Uh, if I wanted to start a fifth node, because I put that affinity rule in, I'm going to get an error starting trying to start a fifth node because there is no way for it to place it. So this is kind of where you need to integrate with the rest of your system management tools because Docker itself is not going to start a new engine for you. You're going to have to be there either automated uh, or through other mechanisms to start a new engine for us to be able to deploy in another container. So here's my application. I can still, uh, I can still vote. It's going a bit slowly. I am running six VMs on this laptop. Um, and then what I can do, just to show you that really is working, I can run another command line tool. Actually, I'm going to cheat slightly uh, just to save a bit of time. Uh, what I'm going to do is run a command line tool called asadm minus ei and my host, which is prod arrow spike one. I'm going to kick that off. Um, and whilst that's running, and I'll show you the new cluster that's formed in a second. So that's how we scaled. Uh, this is a quick or a subset of the state machine that exists within Docker. There is a published API where you can uh, subscribe to these events. So you can see here that you've got the running state in the middle. You can see the commands that get you to these other states. So good friend of ours, Evan Haslett at Docker, uh, created this uh, a component called interlock. And interlock sits on the message bus and looks for the events of containers coming and going. And then it's a framework where you can then plug in a plugin that will now respond to those events. So Evans provided the HA proxy one um, that allowed us to automatically register those web containers um, and would automatically reconfigure HA proxy. Uh, Aerospike have actually added one to do the same for the cluster reconfiguration as those containers start and stop. Uh, so those are all available on, on GitHub as well as Docker Hub if you want to have a play around. What does the plugin look like? Um, they're in Go. Uh, so you can see a bit of Go here where we're taking that um, event and then we're actually executing some commands to actually do that configuration. Again, all the code is on GitHub. You can go and have a look at it. And hopefully, uh, oh, I didn't find any nodes. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I often spell Aerospike wrong. Oh, there you go. Uh, uh, I did spell it terribly wrong, didn't I? All right. Let's leave that running again. OK. So um, conclusions. I know this is super quick. All the slides will be up later. All the code examples here are all up in GitHub as well. Um, so you'll be able to look at those. Uh, the big question you've got to ask yourself is where do you store your data? So there's two basic paradigms. You can store your data inside the container. And uh, as soon as the container shuts down, you lose all that data. Who thinks that's a good idea? I actually think that's a great idea for dev and test uh, for your continuous integration. Because as soon as the container goes, all the data's gone. Hurrah. Uh, would I want to store my IRS returns in there? Probably not. Uh, unless I'm trying to um, hide some data. So typically what people do is um, they use the volume command that you saw earlier to either store the data on the host, i.e. outside of the container, or a, in a network storage device, like, for example, like EBS. They're storing it as a network hop. Obviously, there's some pros and cons for both of those. Uh, typically, people use things like EBS because they like the snapshots and some of the other management facilities. But there are essentially two ways that you could uh, retain the data. There's a third new way, which we've currently got in our lab, which we're doing performance testing and reliability testing. But you can create what's called a data container in Docker now where essentially you can link those containers together. And when the data container shuts down, uh, you don't lose the data. You've got to go out of your way to destruct it. So um, a data container survives um, a, a recycle. Uh, as I said, we've got it in our lab. We're trying to figure all this out, whether uh, we want to recommend that as a deployment practice. And in summary, um, um, you know, what Docker gives you is essentially a simple way from getting dev to production, but it allows the developers to do what they do, which is develop the code and build the application, and allow the ops teams to inject behavior through the life cycle so that they can um, ensure that the application gets deployed into the production infrastructure 
um, in the way that the ops team need to and have to, often because of compliance, other reasons, in order to guarantee um, the way the application runs. Uh, there is code, uh, that's how to get hold of me, and I think we have about five minutes for questions. Any questions? Are all you too shy? Or all of you sitting very patiently because you're waiting for the drawer? Anybody need to do an entry to the drawer? We have a $100 Amazon gift card up for grabs. All right. Caitlin will be around with the fishbowl. Any, so you, I've answered all of your questions. Yes, it was awesome. Yes, it was awesome. Okay. You may come again. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll send out a tweet later uh, today. Um, um, O'Reilly actually put, will put these slides up on their hub as well, but I'll tweet them out later today as well. Um, as I said, all the codes here, here are all the images. If this doesn't make any sense to you, please drop me an email. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Brian in the corner. Uh, great question. So the question was, uh, Interlock and its plugins, are they available in Docker Hub or are they source code? How do they fit in with the rest of the plugins? So um, Interlock is provided as a Docker Hub image uh, along with the plugins. Um, we supply our plugins via um, Docker Hub as well. It's a slightly different model to the volume plugins. Um, um, what we're looking and encouraging Docker to do is to actually provide the, these API hooks as, a, as a, a component inside of Docker itself. At the moment, it's sitting outside. Um, many of the Docker products internally use Interlock, so Docker is very committed to it, but it's a question of um, making those APIs so they become part of the spec. Uh, now there's the OCI, uh, changing specs and putting the things in takes much longer. Um, so hopefully that will all get resolved. All right, any last entries? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to run down to the crowd and get somebody to pick. <laughs> David Wipert? Whippet? Ah, okay. He is our winner of a $100 Amazon gift card. All right. I'll give you this to you in a minute. Um, any last questions? Um, I'd just like to wrap up. Thanks for coming along. Hopefully this was useful and maybe even entertaining. Um, any questions, please don't uh, hesitate to drop me an email. Thanks.